another. I want to be an encouragement, and I need an encouragement. Isn't that the truth? It's good to get together and, and do that. So good to see everyone here today. Uh, uh, normally, I think uh, we'll, we'll give more announcements, but today I'm going to turn things over to uh, Dr. Swangum, and he'll kind of go through some of the normal things he does. All right, good morning. Good to have everybody here. This thing is really high. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to lower that a little bit. <laughs> All right, so I always like to find out if we have any first time visitors here. Anybody visiting with us for the very first time? All right. If we have somebody, we won't embarrass you unless you want me to. I mean, I could have you stand up and. All right, good to have you here. Eventually, somebody will give you something to fill out. We'd like to get a little information from you. And then we'll also give you some information about our church. It's a blessing to have you with us, and we hope you will come back. All right, if you have a handout, our uh, verse for June, June memory verse, is James 1.17. So if you don't have a handout, I'll give you a second to uh, look that up in your Bible, James 1.17, because we're going to all say that together. So I'll give you a second here. Give you other Sunday school classes a chance to, to do that with us, too. All right, we ready? Some of you already probably know it. It's a familiar verse. James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So we'll work on that for these few weeks in June, and last Sunday we'll give everybody a chance to volunteer and say it. The only one we had last, last week for last month's verse was um, Pastor Mitchell's aunt. So how about some of you uh, not senior citizens? I'm going to pick somebody out at the end of the month. No prizes either. No, no two liters, no bags of chips. I'm just going to have you say it. <laughs> All right, our Bible reading schedule is there if you're following along with that. Our missionary... Uh, this week is uh, Brother Ed Alexander, and he's been a missionary to Zill for going on 40 years, faithfully serving the Lord there. He has recently had a cancer surgery, so we want to be praying for his recovery and that God would allow him to be completely healed of that. I think it's a good prognosis that he has, but we don't know all the details. But um, So pray for uh, Brother Alexander as he is dealing with that and also is, uh, has his ministry um, there in Brazil. And our graduates this week are Dan and Christina Duncan. They're at Pleasant Prairie, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, Dan's a pastor up there. And we're thankful for our uh, good graduates. Of course, he graduated. He's a 1990s. He's been out for quite a while. So uh, we're thankful for good graduates. Uh, we want to be praying for uh, the Duncans as we think of our graduates this week. All right. If the... Uh, Ushers would come. We will take the offering. And we'll have Irvin pray for us when he gets up here.
Okay, time we will dismiss a couple of the Sunday school classes, and we're still combining the rest of them. So we'll let the uh, one furthest away get a head start. Says here on my list, a studio, a studia biblica. I always thought it was a studio biblico. Which one is it? That's what. I, okay, so I was right. The paper's wrong. Whoever proofs needs to learn to proof in in Espanol. So. Estudio Biblico is dismissed. Hermano. Class. And then we will have the RU class. We'll meet up top there. RU. And the rest of us, we're going to continue a lesson I started two weeks ago on friends. Actually, the title of the lesson is Evaluating Your Friendships. So this will be part two. Evaluating Your Friendships, part two. And I almost got through part one last week. I mean, last time. So we will see what we can get done today. I'm not scheduled again for a while, so I need to get this thing done. All right, let's pray, and then we'll get uh, going. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for church. Thank you that you reserve the first day of the week as your day, the Lord's day, and that we can be here today to gain encouragement and strength and also warning from your word, and we pray that our lives would be better because we came to church today. And I would ask that you would work in all of the classes, not just ours, but in the ones down in the other buildings and uh, the, 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 the other two adult classes that we just dismissed. Now we pray again that most of all now that you'd speak to our hearts and give us what we need, we pray in Christ's name, amen. All right, so I started last time with Proverbs 13, verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. There's kind of only two options there, right? You can either walk with wise men, and if you do, you'll be a wise guy. I mean, no, you'll, you'll, be, uh, you'll be wise. You'll, you'll have wisdom. You'll have a good life. And if you, you're a companion of fools, your life will be destroyed. You will ruin your life. And I can certainly go back and, and look through my life and see the times where I got myself in the most trouble. I was hanging out with fools. But when I was hanging out with wise people, my life only got better. And so we have choices to make. So I, I asked some questions along the way in this lesson, and we're trying to give answers from the Bible. So the question number one, which was point one, how can I determine if my friendships are good or bad? So to determine that, I asked a series of other questions. And I, I want us now to think about our friends and ask these questions. I'll review the first ones that I gave, and then we'll finish up the, uh, the point and then move on. So <laughs> How can I determine if my friendships are good or bad? Well, whether or not they talk out in church, right? No, 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 just tease them, just tease them. <laughs> First one is, what kind of advice do they give me? Some of you may have handouts. That there's a couple more from last week. Um, I put some extra back there. So if you have one, great. If not, you can just write them on down. So if you've got a blank and you missed that last time, then you can fill in the blank. What kind of advice do they give me? Uh, we need friends who are going to give us good, godly advice that will help us. Um, then secondly was, should I follow their example? Now, that's another way we can determine if our friendships are good or bad. Can I follow their example? What do they do? Because our friends will influence us. And the scripture says in Proverbs 22, 24, and 25, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. You know, it's, 
there are some people they're just always angry they're furious about everything and anything and you hang around those people they're gonna they're gonna rub off on you and what God is teaching us here is that we're going to learn the ways of our friends and tend to follow them. So if they're ungodly, if they're doing evil, it's just a matter of time before we're doing evil. And our friends are going to influence us. The third question was, are they primarily interested in helping me or helping themselves? All right. So a good friend has my interest in mind, not just theirs. And some people will only be your friend when you have something to give them, something to offer them. That could be money, it could be, uh, you know, your possessions. And sometimes, as we mentioned, I think last time, sometimes some young men, oh, I love you to a young lady, and he's not interested in her, he's interested in what he can get from her. So if your friends are only interested in you when you have something to give to them, they're not true friends. Then a fourth question. Do they encourage me to do evil or to do what is right? My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not, Proverbs tells us. So we, we should be concerned what they're trying to get us to do. Hey, come on, let's go do this. Well, is this thing they're trying to get me to do a good thing or a bad thing? Hey, let's go to the movies and watch this thing. Maybe not, because that's not a good thing to be watching. Or, hey, let's go soul winning. Oh, that's a good thing. Let's do that. Let's go to a Bible study. Let's have prayer. Let's, you know, get together and have godly fellowship. We can do that. Then the, the fifth question we gave, do they agree or disagree with my desire to serve God? And I think the, the, the passage we use is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 4 wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. They think it's strange. Something happened to you. Like, what happened? you got this saved thing going on now, and you're different. You don't want to party and get drunk and have a hangover and uh, have all those problems that we have, and we, we think you're weird because you're trying to clean up your life and, 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 and live on you know, better quality of life. And so they think it's strange when people get saved and have, have a, a good, godly, happy life instead of a miserable life where they have to drown their sorrows and, and, and all that other stuff. So do they agree or disagree with my desire to serve God? If they disagree, well, then maybe they're not the best people for me. Then question number six, letter F in your outline, is when I, when I am blessed... Are they happy or jealous? Ooh. Are they happy or jealous? Jonathan uh, was the son of Saul and would have naturally become the next king after his father. Uh, uh, though Jonathan may have been considered the natural heir to the throne, he knew that God had chosen David to be the next king. And David was his friend. Now you'd think, well, there's a conflict of interest here. I'm supposed to be the next king. My dad is Saul, and I'm going to be the next king. But no, God's going to make my best friend David the king. A lot of us would struggle with that. But Jonathan did not struggle with that at all. Instead of being jealous of the blessing that was going to be bestowed upon David, Jonathan embraced it. He accepted it. And he said uh, this to David, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee. Well, because Saul was trying to kill David. And thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. And that also uh, Saul my father knoweth. So he said, you're going to be king, and I'll be next unto you. Well, it didn't work out that he was going to be next unto him. He ended up dying in battle. But true friends are not in a competition to get ahead of one another. And if you're jealous because someone else is blessed, well, they got a nicer this, or they got more of that, and they have an opportunity they don't have, and you're like, well, I've got I've to get that too. That's, that's not a good attitude to have among friends. Your, your, your friendship's not based on who's better than the other one. Okay? So let me get to... Um, 
Another question we can ask. What direction are they heading in life? Just think about your friends right now. Where are they heading? Where are they going in life? Do they have a purpose or do they aim wand, wand, you know, you know, wondrously? So are, are they on a path that's leading to life or death? Heaven or hell? Happiness in this life or misery? Because if we're on the same path that they are, we're going to experience the same fate in most cases that they are, all right? And where do I get that? Proverbs 13, verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. We mentioned this at the beginning of the lesson. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So this verse makes it plain. If we're friends with foolish people, you ruin our lives. Pretty simple. If a person is wise, we do well to follow them because they're going to make us wise. So consider your closest friends that you have right now and determine if they're heading in the right direction. If they're not heading in the right direction, change your friends. There's no use in being good, close friends with them. So, but they're my friends. Okay, then try to influence them to do what's right but don't let them influence you and limit the time and the association that you have with them and limit the activities that you do with them to ones that will enhance a biblical relationship instead of them pull you into an unbiblical uh, relationship with God. Then the next question, are they fair weather friends? Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loveth at all times. That's how you know if someone's a good friend, that they're always there for you. And too many people only act like they care when things are going well, but a true friend, they're always there for you. So I finished point number one. Huh? Well, we can move to number two. How should I choose a close friend? So the last question what we discussed was, was how can I determine if the friendships that I currently have are good or bad? Well, let's take that a next step because some are saying, well, I think some of my friendships aren't quite what they should be. I need some better friends. I need some good friends because good friends will make me good. Bad friends will make me bad. Uh, so how should I choose a close friend? The psalmist looked at two main qualities in a person when he chose his close friends. In Psalm 119, verse 63, he said, I am a companion of all them that fear thee, now he's talking to God, and of them that keep thy precepts. So there's two things that are going on in this verse. I'm a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. So, what I get from this passage is, first of all, a good friend fears God. They have a fear of God. Fear in this verse refers to reverence and respect. Do they revere the name of God? Or do they just use his name flippantly? Do they respect him and what he has to say? Or do they just completely disregard him? He's not in all their thoughts. He, uh, his laws are like, well, those are laws and those are restrictions. And, uh, you know, I see things a little differently than what you see them. I see the things a little differently than what the, your church says. It's always the church, right? Uh, what does God say? How do you, what do you see differently than God? Be holy for I am holy. How do you explain that otherwise? Well, you know, holy is just, you know, kind of like how I feel like today. No. Holiness is separated to God. It's to, 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 to desire a, a life that's without sin. And so a good friend fears God. He said, I'm a companion of all them that fear thee. So if there's people in the church who fear God, all of those people ought to be my companions. If there's people who don't fear God, and they disregard him, and they disrespect him, and he's not in all their thoughts, 
then all of those people should not be my close companions. You, you see, the Bible is really simple. It, it, it's not difficult for us to follow. Now, Psalm 36, verse 1, gives us a little more insight on uh, fear of God. It says, the transgression, this is David speaking, the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. So David's looking out and he's seeing the wicked people sinning, doing what they want to do. And he comes to the conclusion, he says, I see that and that tells me that they have no fear of God. So no fear of God, according to this verse, what I see here is that no fear of God leads to no restraint. There's nothing holding someone back from doing anything they want to do. Because I don't fear God, I don't respect God, I don't revere God, I don't revere his name, I don't revere his laws, his, and, you know. and because of that, then I can do what I want. You can't, you, you can, but you're going to pay for it. So, the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. There are two kinds of fear in this life. Uh, the wrong kind of fear, you know, the Bible teaches we shouldn't have fear, right? He says, fear not, fear not. That's different than this. See, the wrong kind of fear is will prevent us from doing good things, right? You have fear that prevents you from witnessing, giving out a tract. You have fear about taking a stand because you might lose some friends. You, you have fear about tithing because the economy's really tight and you don't know how you're gonna pay your bills. So you, you, this is the wrong kind of fear. It prevents you from doing what's right. But there's a good kind of fear and the right kind of fear prevents you from doing what is wrong prevents you from doing bad things. And so this is the kind of fear he's talking about. The fear of God is the right kind of fear. A friend who has no fear of God is going to be a bad influence, right? And so we've got to be careful about this. So a good friend fears God. That's the first thing I see from that verse that we looked at there. Let me read the verse again. Psalm 119, verse 63. I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. So a good friend, friend fears God, and secondly, a good friend follows God. Right? He takes heed to the things that God says. God says, this, that's what you do. I remember uh, Mr. Reinhardt, Mr. and Mrs. Reinhardt came to visit us in Africa many, many years ago, and it was a great time, and uh, I was told to just have him teach and preach, give me a break, so I loaded him up. I mean, he was teaching and preaching. I was just sitting around doing nothing, right? Uh, and so you probably never taught and preached so much in your life in, in one, one, one given thing. But I remember he got up there, and, and it, was, it was simple. It was profound. It was, it was good, and, I, remember, and I, I still remember the day. He got up and just said, you know what? God makes the rules, and you have to follow him because he's God. It, it was just so simple but so profound. God created us. He makes the rules. So he can tell, he, he can tell us what to do. And so just, if you just accept that, your life will be so much better. God makes the rules. He makes the rules about who I can hang around. He makes the rules about the words that come out of my mouth. He makes the rules about the attitudes I should have. He makes the rules about the entertainment, about the music, about the, the, the shows that I think I can watch. It doesn't matter what I think. because What does God say? One of the things he says is, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. That's what David said uh, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we need to find some people who are heading in the right direction. They follow God. It's, it's not enough just to avoid people who are doing evil. Because you might look at some of your friends and say, well, my, my friends aren't like really bad. They're not like doing horrible things. That's not enough. They also have to be following God. So you can say, well, this, this, this friend over here, they're not like committing adultery. They don't drink. They don't smoke. You know, They don't go to church. They don't like read their Bible. 
So maybe they're okay. They're not okay. You say, and so it's, again, it's not just enough to say that they're not bad. They also need to be following God. So if you've got this misconception that you can choose mediocre friends and they'll be neutral to you, they won't be neutral to you. Because God has given us some instructions and some principles and guidelines on how we can have good friendships. Again, I challenge you, examine your friends today. Are they mediocre? They need to be ones who fear God and ones who follow God. And if they are, amen. If they're not, time to do some rearranging and some choosing of some other friends. Well, let's get to the the next point so that we can finish today. Number three, so number two was how should I choose a close friend, and then number three, how can I uh, get a good friend? How can I get a good friend? Well, first idea is this, be pure. Just be pure, just do what is right. If you wanna get a good friend, you've just gotta be a good person because good people wanna hang around good people. So work on your own life and start doing what's right. Proverbs 22, 11 says, he that loveth pureness of heart for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. I mean, if someone has a pure heart, they can get even important people, those important people who want to do what's right to be their friend. So when King David was looking for companions, he searched for godly people. We find this in Psalm 101, verse 6. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land. So who was David looking for? The faithful, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. So even his servants, the ones he was going to choose out to be his servants, those are going to be people who walked in a perfect way. And I guess, I know I'm saying probably a lot of things in different phraseology, but we tend to attract attract people based on our life, based on our heart. Good people like good people. Bad people seek the company of bad people. Uh, Worldly people like to hang out with worldly people. If you're worldly, you can figure out which kind of people want to hang around you. They will gravitate to you. If you're vain, then you will have vain companions. If you're immodest, then you'll have people who like to dress immodest being your friends. It's just how it goes. So be what you what you want your friends, uh, be, be the kind of person that you would like to have friends like, okay? So if you want good friends, just be a good person. And how do you do that? Just work on pleasing God, and he will supply you with good people along the way. So first of all, if you, how do I get good friends? Be pure. I can't underestimate that enough. Be a good person. If you're complaining about your friends, <laughs> take a look in the mirror, okay? You probably have some of the same problems that they have. That's why they're your friends. Then secondly, be personable. This is the verse that most of you are probably thinking I was going to start with, Proverbs 18, 24. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Well, if I want friends... I have to do something. It's not just about them flocking to me. There's really not that much in me that people are going to flock to. I'm not trying to say go around and try to sell yourself. I'm just trying to say just give of yourself. Show yourself friendly. If you're always on the receiving end of a friendship, I mean, you're the one that's always taking from your friend comes, you're always... You're never saying, hey, how are you? You're waiting for them to say, how are you? And then you let them know how you are. Man, it is so bad right now. And you're just like, you know, pretty soon when people see you coming, they'll find someone else to talk to 
They'll act like they didn't see you. They will turn around and go the other way. They'll do whatever they can to get away from the dark cloud. We have to show ourselves friendly if we want to be friends. So be friendly. Reach out. Try giving of yourself instead of just taking from people all the time. Give of your time. Give a compliment. How much does it cost you to say a kind word to somebody? Absolutely nothing. Yeah. Pray for people. Give of your time in prayer. And then when you see them, you can tell them, hey, how are things going on? You had this prayer request. I've been praying for you. Now, don't tell people that you're praying for them if you're not. <laughs> I was around someone recently, and they said, yeah, you know, I've been praying for you. I said, well, were you praying for them? Well, I was just, you know, I was just saying them. Then don't say that. <laughs> don't say you're praying for it. Well, it's an encouragement. No, it's not an encouragement if you're lying to somebody. Man, anyway, be friendly, reach out, try giving a little bit. And if you're giving of yourself and of your time and of, you know, good, hearty counsel and, 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 and those type of words, then people will respond. Do you know why we love God? We love him because he first loved us. Perhaps we could apply that principle in our lives and start loving other people. And if we did, we might just find out that we might get a little love back. Put that pr principle to practice in your relationships. Uh, because the Bible really does work. So how can I get a good friend? Be pure and be personable. Let's get to our fourth and final question. How can I be a good friend? So, so much of this has already been, most of it's been about friends uh, and, and, and how they influence me. But I want to look at it, we touched on it briefly in this last point, but I want to look at it from another angle. How do we affect other people and, and be a good friend? So we've got a few points here. Let me give you the first one. Tell them about Jesus. I mean, that's pretty simple. You say, where did you get, is that like in the Bible, like if you're friends, you should tell them about Jesus? Actually, it is. Uh, we remember uh, hearing about the, uh, the account of the maniac of Gadara. He got saved. He was, he was a wild man. He was demon-possessed. Jesus changed his life completely, and he wanted to follow Jesus and spend time with Jesus. Why? Because it's only natural. If Jesus did this for me in one day, what will he do in my life if I continue to spend time with him? Of course, he was, you know, it clothed and in his right mind and at the feet of Jesus listening and getting instruction. But Jesus, when, when it was time for him to move on, he had another plan, another job for uh, the former maniac. And we pick it up here in Mark 5, 18 and 19. It says, and when he was come into the ship he ha that had been possessed with the devil, prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not. He, he, uh, the word suffered means to allow. He allowed him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. So one of the best things that you can do for your friends is to tell them about the love that Jesus has for them. Now, is, are all of your unsaved friends going to rejoice to hear that news? You would think they would, but they're not all going to rejoice about that. You start talking about the Bible, and they're like, hey, hey, you know, we can talk about anything, but, you know, there's two things you're not supposed to talk about. There's religion and politics, so just leave that one alone. Uh, if that's the attitude, I'm sorry, then what's the basis of your friendship? Because if you're a good friend, you're going to tell them the truth. You're going to try to help them. If they're not saved, they're not going to heaven. They need Jesus to change their lives. And so we have to be willing and able to talk to them about the Lord. 
And if they have, want nothing to do with my Savior, well, by the way, he's my best friend. You want to talk bad about my Savior? You don't like my best friend and you reject my best friend? I can't even talk to you about my best friend? Well, then I don't know how good of a friend that we can be. So tell them about Jesus. That's how you can be a good friend. And, of course, that goes to say talk to your saved friends about the Lord. Let me just pause here. I think there's a lot of young people, probably not only young people, but a lot of people who say they're saved, but there's very little evidence in their life. They don't really even have much of a desire to talk about the Lord. They don't have a desire to witness. They don't have a desire to do what's right. It's just kind of church has been the culture that they've grown up in, and so they just do the church thing, and they get around their other friends, and they just do what they really want to do. It's what's really in their heart. They do the church culture thing, but that's not it. I don't even know how many of those really are saved. I'm not sitting here trying to you know, put doubts into people's minds, but there, probably, there are some people who should doubt their salvation, the ones who don't have it, the ones who've never had a changed life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You have a new desire. You, you want to read the Bible. You want to listen to the truth. You want God's best. And when, when you're not, you feel miserable and rotten and guilty if you're saved because God's going to be disciplining you and, and working on you and chastening you, trying to get you back to him. So anyway, that was a side, side, side trail there. Tell them about Jesus. Secondly, warn them if they're going in the wrong direction. That's how you can be a good friend. If you see someone walking off the cliff and you just let them walk, uh, chances are you don't really care about them. <laughs> Proverbs 27, verse 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Wounds, wounds. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Now, people like the kisses. They like people, you know, giving them all that, that sweetness. But that's not going to help us when we're in, in error. We need someone who will wound our pride and tell us, hey, you're wrong. You're going down the wrong path. You're wrong. I, I need that kind of friend, but I also need to be that kind of friend. Is that easy to do? To go and wound your friend knowing they're not going to like that. They're going to say, ouch. <laughs> they might stiffen up a little bit. It's not easy. Now, let me say this. It, re it requires tact and concern. It's easy just to let someone have it, right? Just to blast them. Well, I'm just, you know, and we convince ourselves, well, I'm taking a stand for right and I'm just going to let them have it. You can let them have it. You'll be right in what you said, but you'll be wrong in the way you've said it. Anyone else been there? I've been there, done that. I was dead right with what I said, but I was horribly wrong with my approach. And so because of being horribly wrong on my approach, it negates everything I said that was right. And so Galatians 6, 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual... Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. So how do you know if someone's spiritual? You're going to restore them in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So we can warn them, but we don't have to be um, necessarily harsh. Now, there might be some times where we do have to be harsh. You know, someone's running out in the street. Hey, uh, don't go out there. Is a car coming? You're going to get killed. Stop! You know, there are certain times where you have to be a little bit more animated. Anyway, let's get to the next one so I can finish. Be faithful. If you want to be a good friend, be faithful. A friend loveth at all times. I mentioned that before in Proverbs 17, 17. Jesus is, of course, uh, the most faithful friend anyone could ever have, and he provides us a very good example. So let's look at Matthew 26, 49, and 50 for, them, for this example. And forthwith, he, this is talking about Judas, came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. Now, this is when he was betraying him. He gave him the kiss of betrayal, right? And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? 
Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. So here he comes to give the, the, the kiss of betrayal to show the, the, the soldiers, hey, the guy I give that you know, greeting, he's the one, take him and arrest him. And so Jesus know, knew what was going on. Jesus knew it was a betrayal kiss. And what did he say? The first word that came out of his mouth was, friend, wherefore art thou come? A, a friend loveth at all times. To me, I think it was Jesus one last time reaching out, giving an opportunity. Friend, you know who I am. You know I care about you. And yet, Judas still rejected that friendship. So be faithful. And then, fourthly, show pity in their times of affliction. Show, if you have other friends who are having terrible time, Job said this, have pity upon me, have pity upon me, O ye, my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. He needed help. Instead of getting help, his friends condemned him. And it's real easy for us to go up and, you know, criticize everybody. You know, the reason you're having all these problems because this, this, and this, and this, and this. You're just, you know. That doesn't necessarily help people get closer to God. Hebrews 13, 3. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. In other words, empathize a little bit with people. People going through a hard times, say, oh yeah, okay, I'll be praying for you, and then you just, it's flippant, it's careless. That, that doesn't help them. But listen to them. Empathize a little bit. You know, we, we joke about the, the politician said, I feel your pain, and he really didn't. But really, what we should do is feel their pain. Enter into their circumstances a little bit and carry, help carry that burden for them. And then the last thing is avoid gossip. A froward man, that's a perverse man, soweth strife, and a whisperer, that's a gossip, separateth chief friends. So if you're talking about your friends, um, you're going to lose some friendships. Don't be gossiping and, and, and telling all the secrets of your friends. So oh, they're just, I'm sharing prayer requests. No, you're sharing gossip is what you're doing. So you want to be a good friend, follow those things. I hope you'll take time exam and examine your friendships. Uh, the people who you call your friends, are they helping you or hurting you? And then take some time, make sure you're being the right kind of friend yourself. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and how you've given us a lot of clear principles from your word. And I would ask that some of the things that we said today would be helpful to us that we would not just forget them, but we'd apply these things to our lives and really, truly examine our friendships. If we do, we'll have a much better life if we follow what you say about it. Now, bless in the service to follow, we pray in Christ's name.